There we go. There we go. I never remember to turn that thing on. It has such a tiny switch. Well, good morning. Welcome to what is uh, called in the lectionary uh, the second Sunday of Easter. Uh, delighted to have you all here uh, on such a uh, crummy day. And oh, I see people pointing. Are you pointing at me? No, not me. Okay, well, then I'm going to ignore you, Deb. <laughs> Welcome. Happy to have you here today. Just a couple of announcements and. Uh, my dear, did you have some announcements for us for this morning? Yeah. No. Okay. You always have something to tell me in the morning, but I guess. <clears throat> anyway, uh, the one that I wanted to uh, just kind of call out in particular is uh, for those who uh, have in the past enjoyed the McFellowship. Uh, we thought we would uh, re, uh, reconstitute that and uh, try a McFellowship up at the McDonald's in Hutchinson. Again, that'll be this Wednesday morning. It's on the back of your flyer there. Uh, we usually meet on a, on a Wednesday, and it's usually at 1030 up there at the McDonald's. And it's just a, a time of fellowship. And, uh, oh, it might have a, you know, a short little uh, devotion, but mostly it's just a good conversation and an opportunity to, to enjoy each other's uh, uh, company uh, by, the, by the grace of our Lord. So uh, I'll be there at the McDonald's in Hutchinson by 1030 in the morning on Wednesday, April 10th here coming up. And if you uh, want to come and join and have coffee or a Mick muffin or whatever, whatever your heart desires, that's where we'll be. And, uh, and then we'll do that you know, probably again in May and June and maybe take July off or something like that. But uh, anyway, McFellowship coming right up. It's a lot, of, a lot of fun. Anything anybody else might have? Seeing no hands then, I'll invite you to stand and we will sing together our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty from the Green Book. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We read from the first letter of John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so now, in a moment of silence, I invite you all to offer to God what troubles your heart this day.
Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so now, as a member with you in the priesthood of all believers, but by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me now our prayer of the day. I want to put my glasses on and make sure we've got the right one. We don't. I'm going to get just a little closer to the screen and we will pray the one that is on your screen together. Gracious God, through your Son's resurrected presence, you transform us from frightened, self-absorbed people into a community marked by peace, forgiveness, and mercy. Guide us to faithfully be signs to the world of your abundant grace and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is with you now, now and forever. Amen. Well, and then I guess I will invite you all to be seated and we will proceed then with our lessons. The first reading comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as it had need. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> the second reading comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have the fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Would you rise, please? <clears throat> Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. <clears throat> Our lessons today are once again so packed with issues and movements and meanings that I find the best way for me to make sense of it for the sake of preaching is to do as I've done a couple of times in the past and read the gospel lesson in sections and then comment as I go. So we read today from the Holy Gospel according to John from the 20th chapter. And I, I'll invite you to, to be seated now at this time. Grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the other shoe drops today, coming from this gospel lesson of John from chapter 20. Now, we've been reading a lot of Mark, of course, uh, really since the beginning of the year. But now, in this Easter season, we will be shifting over to John and some Luke for these Sundays of Easter that follow Easter Sunday, since there really isn't a lot of post-resurrection witness in Mark. From Mark, though, the dropping of the other shoe is implied, and that was kind of what you heard in my sermon last week when I said that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has not ended, and that its continuation has to do with you. So, John and Luke. And we also tend to stay away from Matthew, too, I suppose, for the sake of completeness to our four writers. Even Matthew, careful and detailed master of the argument, seems in his endings much more deliberate about assuring us that the empty tomb was not the result of grave robbers conspiring to fake a resurrection. Rather, any claims made that the resurrection was faked were bald-faced lies. Those decrying it as fake were the real conspirators, they scheming to refute Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, that was a controversy that came up somewhat early on, and one need not be much of a book critic at all to see that Matthew was determined to set the record straight by the time Matthew got to writing his gospel, it wasn't the next morning. It was many years later. And by that time, this was an argument that had been emerged from the, from the Jewish and the, uh, and the uh, Gentile communities. Oh, it was all fake. You guys went and stole the body, and now you're claiming a resurrection. So Matthew's gospel tried to address that. But <clears throat> let's get on with this lesson from John and talk about that other shoe I mentioned. Well, speaking of last week, I, I, everyone remembers it was Easter, and we were in high celebration mode. We were happy on Easter Sunday, and indeed Christianity was happy. For although Mark's lesson told us only of two frightened women running from an empty tomb, we do live 2,000 years later. We do have the benefit of the full gospel at hand. We know, we do know where the story's going to go, and we know that these frightened women did not remain silent. They couldn't have. Yet we do not run in fear. Well, not exactly. We have learned that on Easter Sunday it's celebration time, right? Christ is risen! Right, here we go. Well, I'm sure our family celebrations maybe lingered a bit, as they, as they always do and should. Though not, by now, I would guess, all of the relatives that visited have probably gone home. All the leftover ham and cheesy potatoes have either been eaten or thrown out. 
And alas, there are no more jelly beans in the dish. Real life has crept back in, and so have worries and distractions and doubts. And here we are, this morning, on what many in my profession with tongue-in-cheek sometimes refer to as Low Sunday. Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, and then Low Sunday. I'm not pointing fingers. And I say with pastoral sincerity, bless all the good Christians who joined us on Easter Sunday to hear the gospel's good news and receive the holy sacraments. God keep them in the palm of his hand. Yet we can see today the lighter attendance. And note, again, with no contempt of heart, that it somewhat makes my point. We've praised the risen Lord and given thanks for his grace and his mercy, and now real life will close in and occupy us for the next, well, 261 days until it's Christmas Eve again. But Jesus is risen, and the resurrection has been witnessed by the faithful. And Jesus is in our presence. Yet this is not the promised second coming. There is more to the gospel story to be written. And there is more of God's purpose and plan to be carried forward. And so, from John 20, beginning at verse 11. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. She turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary's sadness is turned to joy, as Jesus had told them would happen just as she hears his voice, the voice of her shepherd, her beloved teacher. Now her eyes can see that Jesus is with her. And we can imagine from his next words that Mary reaches, perhaps rushes, to embrace him. And why wouldn't she? But he tells her not to hold him. He appears to give as reason that she should not because he has not yet ascended. And that seems a little confusing. I'll give that to you. It invites the question, what's that got to do with hugging? This is kind of another one of those unfortunate lost in translation moments between the Greek, the original Greek, and our English In the original Greek, the sentence is ambiguous, intentionally so. It does not mean that ascension makes the guy unhuggable. What we should take from Jesus Christ's entire statement uh, is that the relationship between Jesus and his disciples is no longer as it was in the earthly kingdom, but is now of a new order. He has risen from the dead and is among his disciples now, but for only a short time. He is, uh, we could say, in transit. And there is no holding him at this point. He must return to heaven in fulfillment of his prophecies, but will be with them briefly to bestow what he had promised, and for John, to prove his resurrection in body and in fact. Continuing then from John 20, from verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came 
and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The disciples' sadness is now turned to joy. As Jesus told them it would be. As they see his presence and hear his voice and observe his wounds. John has a purpose in giving this, the, this somewhat belt and suspenders look at Jesus, his presence, and also his wounds. John, you see, was writing at a time when there were dissenters out there in the Christian community speaking against the matter of Christ's nature as true God and true man. These dissenters, the docetists, as we call them, the docetists asserted that what came from the tomb was in fact a ghost of Jesus, not of human flesh. So John meets that head on, that even though Jesus entered a locked room, he was present in the flesh and so allowed his disciples the opportunity to prove it for themselves, not only by seeing him, but by touching his wounds as well. And in so doing, prove it to us. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, the matter of entering a locked room should not be a point that takes us away from our focus. John's not trying to distract us with a cool magic trick that Jesus could do on account of he was Jesus and all. John wants us to understand that Jesus will come to us as he will. Everything in our world is of God's creation. And none of it, therefore, could ever be an obstacle to true God. We cannot wall him out. We cannot lock our lives in and away from him. Continuing then, John 20 from verse 21. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. the gospel of our Lord. We are told then that Thomas was not with them on that first occasion. And the next time the boys see him, they fill him in on what happened and what they saw, and he expresses the doubt that history has pinned on him and the nickname Sunday school kids learn by the time they're nine or ten years old. Doubting Thomas. 
a title he doesn't deserve, in my opinion, for he asks nothing more than the other ten had received from the Lord. John told us a couple of verses ago that they didn't believe until they'd seen. Thomas is stuck only because he voices that same doubt that they all had until they had seen with their own eyes. Well, but Jesus fixes all of that as well about a week later when he comes in the same way as before and he offers Thomas the same proofs he'd extended to the others. He wants Thomas to believe. And Thomas does. And John then gives Thomas what is arguably the biggest moment of the gospel writing. Thomas proclaims the culminating point of John's 20 chapters, the annunciation of John's high Christology, my Lord and my God. Thomas speaks now what John had not said before, nor the other gospel writers, not straight out and plain like this, that Jesus the Lord is God. But in all of this revelation and sadness turning to joy and unbelief turning to belief, well, we are only reading a new level of groundwork. The critical part of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that a locked room full of people came to a common belief together but that Jesus called upon them to unlock those doors, throw them open, and march out through them. That they are commissioned by God to go forth into the rest of the world proclaiming the truth of what they'd seen and heard, baptizing and absolving sin with the power they'd received of the Holy Spirit. And here drops that other shoe. Here begins the rest of the gospel story in you. For the commission of your risen Lord and Savior calls you to unlock your doors, throw them wide open, and march out to proclaim God's victory to all the world, to your countrymen and women, to Minnesotans, to Renville County neighbors, to Buffalo Lake brothers and sisters. The true bodily resurrection of the Son of God has freed you, washed you clean and white as freshly fallen snow. Sin is no longer an obstacle. Death no longer locks a door. You are free as you were baptized in water and the Holy Spirit to go forth into your world to write your chapters of the gospel of Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God. Yes, the commission is to you also because like for Mary and the ten and for Thomas, Christ's death and resurrection were for you. Thanks be to God. May the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, we have a hymn of the day. Won't we all stand? Why not? Love divine, all loves excelling.
Well, and we are past the, the day of Easter, and so we return now to the words of the Apostles' Creed. Remember, we had used the Nicene throughout the Easter season, or the Lenten season. But Lent's over, and now we're in the season of Easter. So we will proclaim today our, our faith in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And so we proclaim, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's share with one another a sign of that peace. Mix it up. Let's pray together then our offertory prayer, and we pray, Lord, we thank you for the many gifts you have given us. Teach us to use them in charity and compassion, in stewardship and service to others. Through your Holy Spirit, give us awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may praise you on our lips and in our lives, that we may give ourselves to your service that we may walk in your ways 
holy, and by the righteousness of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy God, like your first apostles, inspire us to go into the world with the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may have the words to speak of your saving grace to all who are lost or alone or without hope. May we share Christ with all whom we meet that the world might be transformed by your love. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you know our fears and concerns. Grant us your grace in time of anxiety and worry. Teach us to cast all our cares upon you. Give us your peace that passes understanding. As we live in the middle days of life, days when we are not filled with Christmas or Easter hopes and expectations, days when the daily life occupies us more than our love for you. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Lord, you are the source of all creation. You put the heavens and the earth in their proper place, bringing warmth to the earth as seed is planted. Continue to bring rain and water our grounds. Provide those who work the soil with the tools and resources they need that a bountiful harvest may be reaped in the proper season. Lord, in your mercy. Our Lord and our God, you are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Help us always to put our complete trust in your ways. We ask that you would bring healing and wholeness to all those in such need this day. Especially today we remember Lori and Vanessa, Keith and Anne, Don, Dave, Helen, Ardell, and we remember those in care centers like Phyllis and Bob Jr., Zelda and Mary Ann, Doris and Wes, Tom, Ruth and Mabel, and those that each of us now name in our hearts or on our lips. May they know their lives are in your eternal hands. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to Almighty God. Amen. It was on the night in which he was betrayed when our Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take all of you and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took a cup 
And when he had given his thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take all of you and drink, for this is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Let's pray together now the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All is ready at the table of the Lord, and all who call upon the name of Jesus Christ are welcome. Children who have not yet begun to commune are welcome to be brought forward for a blessing. We'll commune the assistants, and then the ushers will direct you accordingly. You may be seated.
Now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve us all unto life everlasting. Send us forth from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, let us rise and sing our closing hymn, please. Uh, Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh, it's from the Blue Book. Go now in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.